I could sit here and I could be Captain Obvious and tell you a couple ways that you're increasing your cortisol levels. But I don't want to be Captain Obvious. I want to tell you interesting things. And I want to give you interesting things that you can change within your life so that you can have sort of this systematic approach of improving your life and improving your weight loss. Not just by hearing, hey, you need to live a healthy lifestyle and you need to live a stress-free life. We know that stress is correlated with cortisol, okay? It's simple, it's a stress hormone. But there's other physiological things going on inside our body that cause stress and can cause the release of cortisol. And cortisol can contribute to belly fat, but cortisol can also be a good thing. We're not gonna talk about that today, but cortisol is a big driver for belly fat. So if we understand things that are underlying causes of cortisol, we could actually get to the root of the problem a little bit more, or at least start identifying roots. This isn't designed to be like, the five only things that are spiking cortisol in your life. This is designed to be five really interesting things that I've found through scientific literature that are causing cortisol increases. So let's dive right in. Uh, hey, make sure you hit that red subscribe button, then hit that little bell icon to turn on notifications because we've got new videos almost every single day these days. You don't wanna miss a beat. The first one is, believe it or not, a lack of protein or just a protein deficiency causes an increase in cortisol. How wild is this? Like we never would have thought that. Okay, a low protein diet isn't necessarily bad, right? But you need to have sufficient amounts of protein. You can't be deficient in it. So there was a study that was published in the journal Molecular Endocrinology. So what this study found is that when people were deficient in leucine, there was an expression of adrenal corticotropin releasing hormones. So that simply means that when there was less leucine, less protein in the body being consumed, the body upregulated the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. It upregulated cortisol. Why? Because it's probably a stress response. Your body doesn't have what it needs to actually support normal function, so it goes into a little bit of stress. Now, that being said, don't get me wrong, okay? Leucine uh, deprivation could actually lead to a little bit of fat burning, but it also leads to aggressive muscle wasting. You don't want to be losing weight via a low protein diet because what's happening is, sure, you're losing weight but you're losing muscle weight and you're losing some fat. So you wanna be losing fat and preserving your muscle because that's how your resting metabolic rate continues to thrive so that you continue to burn fat. Otherwise, you're losing your precious muscle tissue. So it's really interesting to see that when our body is deficient in leucine, that we actually, again, leucine being sort of a, a synonymous word for protein in this case, we have a big increase in corticotropin releasing hormones, ultimately cortisol. So later on down the line, this affects us big time. So it is important that you get sufficient protein in by whatever means necessary, okay? The next one is magnesium deficiency. This is number two. Magnesium deficiencies play a big role in just chronic elevation of cortisol. You see, there's some studies that back it up too. There's a study that was published in the journal Neuropharmacology, and it found that when magnesium levels were low, or there was a deficiency in magnesium, which by the way, like 70% of people are deficient in magnesium, there was a very strong increase in overall corticotropin-releasing hormone. Now this was predominantly in what's called the paraventricular nucleus portion of the brain. So basically what that means is when magnesium was deficient, it was activating a portion of the brain that triggered the release of cortisol from the other areas of the body, from the adrenals, right? So it was actually affecting the epicenter and affecting cortisol being released later on down the line. Now, how does this happen? It's actually pretty simple. So you have this thing called an NMDA receptor. And this NMDA receptor is sort of like a gate. And if excitatory things hit that gate, then it lights up the body and the body gets stressed out. Magnesium sits as a guard at this gate. It guards the NMDA receptor and actually blocks things from triggering it to get riled up. I want you to think of this gate having this out of control troll that lives there and he's very volatile. And if something comes to the gate and gets close to the troll, usually you end up having the magnesium that acts as sort of a buffer, like kind of like, hey, don't go upset the troll. Don't go upset the troll. You don't want to upset him. But if magnesium is deficient, then that means the guard is out to lunch. So that means something comes in there and activates the troll and he freaks out. And then your whole system gets freaked out and you get stressed out and then you have an increase in cortisol. And you don't even realize that you have this chronic increase in cortisol, it's just happening. Okay, the next one we have to talk about is a leaky gut and this is a huge one because now we're starting to see correlations. We can connect the dots here. There's a study that was published in the journal Gastroenterology that found that like irritable bowel syndrome, for instance, was correlated with, of course, inflammation in the gut, but which had a correlation with an activation of the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. Complicated way of saying simply this. When we have inflammation in our gut, it is affecting our cortisol. 
Now, IBS, obviously, inflammatory bowel disease, this is an easy way to identify it, right? It's clearly surrounding inflammation. But you know what else triggers inflammation? Eating a lot of grains, specifically eating gluten. Okay, gluten triggers the release of a protein called zonulin, which causes a leaky gut and triggers specific IL-6 inflammation. Okay, interleukin-6, so a particular cytokine. So let me connect the dots. You're giving yourself inflammation by consuming gluten, whether you are celiac or not, and this inflammation is causing an increase in cortisol and activation of your hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. So definitely not a good thing. We're talking about low grade levels of cortisol, but you combine these three things that we've just talked about and it elevates and it activates a lot of different levels, right? It's a cumulative buildup. So you have to be very, very careful. Okay, it's very important that you're paying attention to all these little things. Just so that you guys do know if there is interest, I put together a, like a hormone bundle with Thrive Market. So Thrive Market is an online grocery store. It's actually pretty cool. So it makes it so you can get all the groceries that you would normally get at the grocery store, but you get them through like an online market, right? So that's what Thrive is all about. But the cool thing is there ends up being cheaper than Whole Foods or cheaper than the grocery store. I've worked with Thrive long enough that I've been able to put together specific keto bundles and fasting bundles and hormone optimization bundles and all this stuff of like the top groceries that I would pick that help these things. So I did put together some groceries that have to do with cortisol modulation and hormone modulation and it's down below in the description. So all it is is just a bunch of different groceries that I would recommend that you get from Thrive. So after you watch this video, go check them out because it definitely plays a perfect role with what I'm talking about here. Controlling cortisol, controlling the right kinds of grains and the right kinds of nutrients that are coming in, but also making it so that we're not having this constant nag on our hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis in this case. Now the next one we have to talk about is visceral fat. Now this is not necessarily a habit, but there are some things that you can do to switch this up. So I will give you a habit shift, okay? If you're in the habit of eating multiple meals per day and not having long periods of time between your meals, like you're snacking all the time, you're gonna wanna switch that, that's a bad habit. Here's what happens. If you have visceral fat, you have more enzymes that are related to cortisol. You also have four times as many cortisol receptors in your visceral belly fat than you do anywhere else in your body, which means you have more cortisol activity there, more cortisol that's binding there, meaning more fat accumulation there in a vicious circle. You can see that's exactly how people end up with a pot belly or exactly how people end up with belly fat. It is that cycle specifically that does this, okay? Of course, with overeating of calories, right? Now, what happens is if you fast or you go periods of time between meals, you allow the body to switch over from white adipose tissue to brown adipose tissue, and that helps burn that fat. It burns the visceral fat specifically. So you're decreasing the amount of fat that actually has enzymatic activity and cortisol receptors. So stop eating super, super frequently and start having legitimate gaps with no snacking between your meals. And it'll make a big difference in terms of how your cortisol receptor activity is for the long term, okay? Now lastly, this is a very big one, and it's not in the traditional sense. I am gonna talk about lack of sleep, which sounds kinda lame, but trust me, I'm coming at it from a different angle. Okay, the journal Sleep published a study, took a look at individuals and it broke them down into doing a normal sleep study, then a partial awakening sleep study where they woke them up a couple times, and then a total sleep deprivation portion of the study. And they wanted to measure the difference in cortisol and hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis activation and everything like that. Well, what they found was pretty wild. On a normal sleep schedule, there was no difference in cortisol from days one to two. But on partial and total sleep deprivation, they found there was an increase of cortisol 37% on day one and 45% on day two for both partial and total, showing that even just a partial sleep deprivation plays a big, big role. Now, that's kind of obvious. We know when we're not sleeping, our cortisol is probably going up. But what's interesting is they noticed that it affected the resiliency. It's like we had so much cortisol coming in all the time that the cells became somewhat immune to it and our body started to need to produce more to get the same effect at the cellular level. So basically, by being sleep deprived, even by a small amount, it actually makes it so that your body has to keep on producing more to get the same desired effect, which means that it can be really bad for your waistline, right? So we have to be very, very, very particular about our sleep. Now, sleep quality is gonna be more important than sleep uh, quantity, right? So that's why it shows that like, someone that has broken sleep is almost just as bad as total sleep deprivation as far as cortisol is concerned. So you're better off to get like four hours of deep sleep than you are to get eight hours of broken sleep. Now, I know this was a long-winded way to explain five things that are increasing your cortisol, and I know there's probably dozens, if not hundreds of other things that increase cortisol, probably thousands, but I wanted to give you something different, and something that you could apply into your life so that you can start making better choices and get the best body and the best health that you've ever had. As always, make sure you're keeping it locked in here on my channel, and I'll see you soon.